Welcome everyone to our Ask the Experts panel for the machine learning and artificial intelligence track. Um, today we're hoping to discuss how open source te technologies and the communities behind them are driving new innovations that are shaping the future and resulting in solutions with meaningful impact to the world. Um, our panelists will be providing insights into sort of this concept of how data centers are changing in response to the amount of data that's being generated and processed and, you know, utilized, um, you know, questions on things like edge computing and AI and machine learning are very much welcome here and you know, appreciated. Uh, we'll also be talking a little bit about how Red Hat is working with open source communities to develop these cutting edge um, technologies that are integrated into the into like you know your open source stacks. Um, yeah, great. So with that, I'll start. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Marcel Hild. Um, Marcel. Oh, you wanted to introduce me, so I should introduce well, myself. So that's also I'll call out your name, <laughs> and then we'll <you're> introduce yourself. <laughs> so yeah, um, Marcel Hild. I'm dialing in from Germany on the internet on that beautiful Twitch-like platform, um, and I'm managing a team of data scientists and software engineers in the office of the CTO at Red Hat, and I just work started working on AI like two years ago. So I'm not really an AI expert, but given my given my background in software engineering and systems administration and my focus on applying AI to these domains, I think I'm a good um, crossover person to see both sides of the game because AI just for the sake of AI is pretty boring and systems operations just for the without the help of ai can be really <clears throat> tough so why not combine the both and that's the topic that i've been working on for the past two years something called ai ops very cool um next up we have sanjay arora also. Uh, yeah so, thanks anish so i'm also in uh, the ai coe in the office of the cto and most of my work is uh, more focused on machine learning for for systems. So one of our big projects is uh, tuning network cards, for example. So this is pretty low level uh, systems analysis that includes both uh, what I would call classical data science. So uh, analyzing log data, understanding uh, things like the, the details of the TCP protocol and you know, seeing what's what's getting reflected in the data, as well as uh, more black box uh, machine learning solutions like reinforcement learning for uh, learning policies. Hey, great. Thanks. Thanks, Sandra. Um, finally, we also have Eric Erlinson. Um, Hi, yeah, I'm Eric. Um, I also work in the COE and um, I'm part of uh, what we've been calling forward deployed engineering and a lot of what we do is helping to enable both customers and also uh, Red Hat uh, field people in what it means to do application development for intelligent applications on OpenShift. So essentially machine learning workflows and DevOps on OpenShift and Kubernetes. Absolutely. That's, I, I think that's very, very important for a lot of people today, right? <laughs> Figuring, how, figuring out how to get started with these workloads. Um, I guess I should introduce myself as well since I'm the moderator. Uh, so, um, yeah, my name is Anisha Stana. Uh, I'm also I'm just an engineer uh, in the AI Center of Excellence, and I'm working on the Open Data Hub. Um, yeah, and really the, that operation side, which Marcel mentioned, and that's kind of my focus and interest. Okay, so. I'll start things off with some freebies. Um, so anyone can really take these. Uh, can you guys explain to me what the difference is between artificial intelligence and machine learning? Is there a difference? Um, I bet all of us would have something to say about that, but just for last, I'll start. Um, so 
mean, artificial intelligence is technically broader than machine learning um, in the sense that all machine learning is a kind of artificial intelligence, but there are forms of AI that really aren't ML. Um, I think back to the 80s with expert systems, they were a kind of artificial intelligence that weren't about algorithms learning from data. They were typically humans encoding, you know, complex, complex interacting systems of rules. Um, where the behavior emerged out of those, but it wasn't learning from data in the way that most ML is. Yeah, I completely agree. And just to add a bit more to that, uh, if you look at, you know, if someone asked you to define AI and you said, okay, what does artificial mean? What does intelligence mean? It, it's one can define it to say, can I, can I write programs? Can I write code or algorithms that solve uh, tasks that involve perception of some kind. So it could be, you know, of course, classically it's computer vision or it's speech processing, natural language processing, but really at a even deeper level, it is reasoning. Can I get a computer to prove uh, that there are infinite prime numbers, for example? Right? That's an old proof. It's a classic proof. Can computers do that? And like Eric said, there's really a priori, no reason one would say, well, let's look at data. You could very well say, yes, I'm going to come up with a very smart algorithm with some rules uh, and with some propositional logic that says, look, just try and combine these maybe on a tree of some kind to a search and you can prove these things. Machine learning or what's also often called statistical learning is exactly what Eric said, which is the idea that, well, let's not bother with we're trying to figure out these rules. Let's uh, give you enough examples, right? Let me give you examples of images, or let me give you examples of proofs in some uh, uh, computer readable format. And let's focus on algorithms that can infer patterns from the data instead of algorithms that can solve our task directly. So uh, of course, we now take it for granted that machine learning is the dominant way of solving AI tasks doesn't have to be data centric, but that works very well today. Yeah, and I would add to that the catchy, um, f catchy thing of AI you would use when you try to get some funding for your business nowadays, or if you want to attract salespeople to listen to you. And if you talk to a um, engineer, you probably talk about machine learning to get them interested in the tools that you're doing. And if you're talking to the real data scientists, you probably talk to them about statistics because in the end, what we're doing is uh, steroids, right? So um, if this, like Eric said, this AI field has a really long history and it was even back in the 80s um, when we tried to build out expert systems. And I think today we're really using advanced statistics or as somebody said, um, regex on steroids um, to do a really, really common and uh, narrow task of identifying um, some patterns that humans are not uh, capable of identifying and then actually solving this task really, really good. But is that intelligence? You could argue, right? So I would really say let's define what intelligence is and if we can come up with an artificial intelligence maybe um, we need to rethink how we approach this field anyways today because right now it's really it's really more about at least in the in the in the um, commercial world at um, solving narrow tasks for getting stuff done and uh, growing your business I'd like to harp on that like sort of business aspect a little bit, right? Like um, I've seen some of your talks in the past talking about like AI ops. Can you talk to our attendees a little bit about what that really means and how you see that helping companies? Yeah. So when, when I started working on or trying to understand what AI ops, AI ops means was, um, okay, let's use AI to fix operations. But um, we pretty soon hit a wall there 
because we can't just fix operations with um, throwing data over the wall and applying AI to this, right? Um, that you don't get interest from the operational uh, folks because they are pretty happy right now with the tooling that they have of identifying patterns and um, coming up with thresholds. And you really need to convince the AI folks to get an interest in operational problems. So right now, I'm, I think it's, it's a grab bag for commercial providers to sell their ops tools in order to just prefix it. Uh, so just prefix it with AI and you get, um, you get, you get uh, more eyes on it and you get more funding and you get more, more visibility basically. But then a lot of these tools are basically just a little bit of pattern analysis and time series. And you still need to do the ops thing manually in an operational um, approach. So I'm right now seeing it more as DevOps, the DevOps movement where we combined or brought the um, de developer mindset and the operational mindsets together. So developers using some tools from ops to set up um, environments and the ops people using tools like Git um, and uh, other things from the development world um, to build out their tool belt and uh, bring up their capabilities to another level. And if we stack some AI on top of this, I think we can answer some questions better and solve some problems um, more elegant than with just the tools that the DevOps people right now have. So I think it's it's more an educational thing. How do I get Jupyter notebooks um, into the hands of the operational person or to the developer person, and at the same time also, um, yeah, getting AI folks interested in operational problems. Right now they are pretty much focused on identifying cats in images or identifying Alexa, although Alexa really um, seemed to have dementia right now. She's getting worse and worse, at least in my home. Yeah. I, I want to riff on something you just said too, which is that a lot of people think of you know, artificial intelligence as like, oh, I'm turning over the whole thing to some algorithms. And you know, what you talked about earlier, where it's like, well, you got some pattern recognition algorithms presenting you with some results, but there's a human in the loop that's like translating that into actions. And so like, we used to call it, I don't know, AI assist um, more than like full AI, but that's, there's a huge continuum there where, you know, you automate certain things just to make, make the human component of the decision-making easy. It's not closing the entire loop with a bunch of code all the time. Yeah. The, I think, a big disservice has been done to to the work of most you know data scientists or in the financial world, world it's quants right or actually many data driven scientists a big this service has been done by this idea which which is that you can get a data set right on kaggle or some image data set like marcel is saying cats and dogs and now you have a static note, well, static in the sense you have a notebook and you just sequentially write your code and you get an accuracy of 80 something percent, 90 percent, and you're done. That's machine learning or data science. And at least in my experience, the most successful data driven projects involve so much back and forth with uh, between the data scientists, the software engineers and the and the domain experts. And in our case, of course, we are lucky that the software engineers and the domain experts are the same. But as a very concrete example, one of the projects that we are working on with Boston University, it's literally two people who have a lot of experience in systems engineering and me as a data scientist. And we literally sit on a phone call sometimes for six hours, eight hours, not in one go, but in one day. 
and it's literally looking at the data and these guys can say, I know what the TCP protocol does, that doesn't make sense. And I'm sitting here saying, well, maybe I can use a decision tree to do this and ex extract some patterns and analyze that. And, and most real data science projects have that collaboration between the domain expert and, and the data scientists. And it's the same thing with the AI ops world. It's really uh, understanding what the operational person deals with every single day. What are the issues they encounter? And initially machine learning or statistics or, or even very you know, simple mathematical rules just help them improve their workflow by a percent here, by 5% there. The fancy, you know, reinforcement learning policy gradient thing comes closer to the end. Uh, and one cannot do that without really understanding what that operational person deals with every single day. So would you say, well, within a given project then, uh, would you say that the domain knowledge itself is more important than the data? This may be a loaded question asked by someone who doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I mean, it depends, right? So I, I would say this, um, for many projects, data and domain knowledge take you 90, 95% of the way, right? You, you can get away without knowing machine learning most of the time. And, uh, it's it's only in a few cases where I think you can, uh, I, I completely understand why computer vision that has been revolutionary to have these deep neural nets doing this. And there are many tasks around the world from, from uh, you know, things like you're exercising and is your form correct, something as simple as that to uh, maybe, you know, sorting fruits or something. I can understand in those cases why you get such a big impact from just picking someone else's models. But I think in our world, sometimes having a hard-coded rule does take you 80% of the way, and that's completely okay. Right? You don't have to put a model in. Uh, so I would say they are definitely more important than the machine learning bit, but there are certain projects, and they're not the vast majority of the projects, where getting someone with a quantitative skill set, whether it's machine learning or physics or math or statistics uh, can can really make a big difference. And, it, and in some ways we are working on that cutting edge, right? Even if people don't believe that, like what, what AI ops is doing is at that cutting edge. There are some companies that have automated, a, you know, maybe, I'm sure at Google internally, they have many tools that do automated anomaly detection, better uh, load balancing, things like that. When you're working there, yes, it helps to know linear programming well. It helps to know uh, stochastic processes well. But the vast majority of cases, I would say domain expertise and good data take you a long way. Yeah, I, th I think I think um, you definitely need the domain expertise because it's not this throwing data over the wall yet, right? So once we really have general intelligence or we can um, we can deal with unsupervised learning problems you know much better way maybe then ai can kickstart us uh, better but right now um, the data scientist needs to understand the domain knowledge and that's only possible by talking to the domain expert and um at least in in that's what i'm yeah pro yes yes or no yeah and i would yeah. the only other thing i would add to that marcel is you need the domain expert, of course, to make sense of the data many times, but you need the domain expert to tell you what problem to solve. It's like me yeah. showing up in a in a hospital, right, in an oncology unit and saying, give me all your scans. I'm going to do something with this. And maybe I'll say, oh, you know what? I'm going to automatically find tumors or something. And maybe the oncologist will say, that's not useful to me, right? I like looking at this myself and our error rates are very low. And I have, uh, you know, it takes me five minutes. Now I know nothing about medicine. And I picked a bad example because actually that's a use case for machine learning, automated tumor finding. Uh, but an oncologist still looks at it. They don't ignore the scan. But in our world, like if I show up to the AI ops world, certain problems jump out at me and they might be completely, uh, useless to the operational 
frontline person, right? They might say, I don't care about the anomaly detection on this one metric. Uh, so I think they really need to, it, it's a balance. The domain expertise has a bunch of problems they would like to solve. A subset can be solved by data science or machine learning, and you need both people to identify that subset. Yeah. I think there's a, also brings up a skill set issue, which is that successful, successful data scientists are people who, you know, are good at that kind of interaction, being able to reach out to domain experts and talk to them and actually understand their concerns. And it's not, it's not always easy to like pull out what's important. You got to be able to chat people up and iterate with them. And you really have to have like that kind of interpersonal um, skill set as well as the technical to do this data science successfully. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the actual, that, that's the great times we're right now living in because data science uh, becomes more easier uh, uh, becomes easier to apply to certain problems. I'm, if, it's a little bit like comparing assembler language to um, um, C and then JavaScript, right? So, um, every, so getting into the software development world now is much, much easier than like 20 years ago, right? Because we have so many easy uh, onboarding tools and online courses, etc. cetera. And um, nowadays I can apply um, K-means clustering without being able to implement K-means clustering. But if I'm grasping the intuition and I can do that with just watching a five minute YouTube video to understand what K-means actually is doing, and then I can prepare some data and with some lines of code, I can apply it to a data set. And I think that's, that's the educational part. So I think some of the mission is also to take away the magic from AI and from um, advanced statistics and machine learning and make it um, ubiquitous and usable by also the average software engineer. Yeah, I was gonna, I'm interested what you guys think about this because there's like two sides to that. One is, yeah, the democratization that's happened here has been really powerful. Um, uh, on the flip side, you know, occasionally, if you've been in the position of actually implementing these algorithms, you have certain intuitions about like their failure modes and you know what kinds of tuning parameters, what they're going to do on certain kinds of data that you don't always get if you know you did what you described. Is you know, it's like I don't. Know, it's become very easy to get some kind of useful result, um, but having like gone into the guts of the code and the algorithm gives you certain kinds of in, insights that can be useful. And I'm curious if you guys see that kind of trade-off going on. I mean, I, yeah, I struggle with this question because like my first introduction to programming was in a physics context. And these are, you know, molecular dynamics and you're running these simulations. And that's the first time when you, work with that or data, you you see the difference between a compiler emitting an error, an error saying, you know, you, you didn't declare the type or something like that. At least I can fix that, right? I can, I can, it identified it for me. But logical errors are harder. And errors in anything with data, any scientific uh, computation, the problem is it, like you said, Eric, it will emit some number and unless I understand the context and what I should expect, it's very hard to know if this is the right thing or the wrong thing. And uh, in the physics case, it's easy because you spend years studying physics and then you say, okay, you know, when I plot this quantity, I know what to expect roughly. And you can do all the checks and balances. When you do it with, so when a software engineer does it with data, they might get fooled by something that the algorithm is doing that they don't understand, but they at least understand the data so they can say, well, I clearly, you know, the act package that I'm getting on my network clearly should not be 400 bytes or something. And the data scientists can get fooled because we don't understand the domain. So we say like, sure, the act packet can be four kilobytes. It's okay. And I don't know a solution to that except to say they should work together. Which yeah. is <laughs> 
And I think it's it's a matter of interface design, right? So um, a very well defined language um, prevents you from making errors like syntax errors and uh, type errors, etc. And I think the same is also should be true for um, scikit learn modules right so if you get back a certain number it should prevent you from interpreting that number in a really wrong way and also coming up with best practices how to interpret these results and feedback loops um, it's again an educational thing and you can make this easier by designing the interface to these um, models or these uh, uh, things where you throw in the data and get your numbers back um, um, just more meaningful. I, I do think the interface can help a lot in terms of uh, just at least controlling the, the, you know, for lack of a better word, the ranges of the numbers that come out, for example, right? Or uh, a silly example is k means, I say, negative five clusters. And of course, it says, are you crazy? But uh, it gets fuzzier when it's it's like you know uh, like Shrey's talk earlier today where he was clustering and uh, systems and you see five clusters versus you see ten clusters and I would have zero idea it maybe that's a bad example but you can I I I, I don't have a good example in mind right now but maybe there's a case where you should see five clusters and maybe because of the way you featureize your data or something you see ten. And that's something I think there's no general rule or interface that can capture that because the big part that's changing all the time is the data that's going into your algorithms because the domains vary so much. Um, and there I agree with you, Marcel, it's an educational process where uh, at the end, the most important thing is having that scientific mindset of being very, very skeptical and doing a lot of checks and saying, am I fooling myself or is this some yeah. real thing pattern in my data. And maybe I'm saying this because of my engineering background. So I saw myself growing better at software development by reading just more and more books and uh, practicing all over again, mm -hmm. right? So I um, did test-driven development and that was way better than just um, writing spaghetti code yeah. when I grew up, right? So applying these best practices to software development made me doing fewer mistakes yeah so maybe the one question could be asked uh, is there a can all these best practices that we know from software engineering or from operations can they also be applied to machine learning and ai problems or is there a different set of best practices um, that we are still learning given that ai is such a young field and maybe in 10 years from now um, these problems just don't exist anymore, that we have five clusters versus 10 clusters, um, because we have, I don't know, feature-driven engineering in, for AI, or cluster-driven engineering. <laughs> no, I, I, that's definitely, it's only true. And of course, I mean, just the phrase ML workflows on OpenShift or cloud-native development for AI, uh, you know, applications is just, just those, just those phrasings, you know, is basically assuming the idea that software, existing software development practices apply equally well to, you know, the software we do with artificial intelligence as, you know, a more traditional software. Um, and it's a huge socialization uh, task because a lot of you know, some, some data scientists are fairly hip to that others definitely are not um, and it takes more than just you know showing up at a customer and saying well you know we're going to do some devops on machine learning it's like well you know, they, they've got a stack and you know we may be able to point out all kinds of like process issues with the way they do stuff, but they're used to doing it a certain way and telling them to like, you know, <clears throat> they're going to have to like do a bunch of churn to like change all their tooling and log into some platform, you know, they, um, 
intrinsically, they don't want to do that because they, for better or worse, they know how to use the tools they got. Um, so it's, you know, I think getting getting data scientists to realize that what they're doing is still software development and, yeah, like Marcel said, you know, test-driven development, um, <clears throat> repeatable, repeatable builds, you know, all these things that we think of as kind of bread and butter because we're like immersed in it, you know, people still need to get their minds around it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, Shrey is asking, <laughs> um, do you think that data scientists should be diving into only into problems that they're willing to be domain experts in? Or should the onus be on the domain experts to start um, learning how the algorithms are returning the results they're returning or why they're doing that? Um, and where, where do you think that balance lies? Right. I, my personal opinion is the data scientist needs to be a little bit more willing to interface with the domain expert. Um, I mean, sometimes, sometimes if they're asking you to do something which is not possible or, you know, defies the laws of mathematics or something, you may need to, like, you know, explain something like that. But generally speaking, you know, the, the domain experts typically, for, if for no other reason politically, the domain expert is typically the customer. And so, like, you're there to serve the customer. Um, and you try to... Uh, you try to meet them more than halfway whenever possible. That's I guess how it works for me usually. Yeah, I, I would agree with with that too. I would. I mean, I can only speak for data scientists, but uh, I do see. I mean, one major reason I came to Red Hat initially was because I was interested in systems engineering, right? So I I do want to understand how the Linux kernel scheduler works and that helps a lot because i want to do it i'm happy to read a paper or look at the code or something i have been in situations in my past careers where i'll give you a concrete example i worked on an investment banking team for some time as a data scientist and they wanted to do all kinds of things with ipos and companies raising money and i didn't care not one bit right but I'm there, I have this data, I'm supposed to do something. And psychologically it gets in your way because really what I should be doing is going to the people who actually help companies go public and say, what do you do? What do you look for? What's the process? And when you enjoy the domain or you're interested in it, you, you go and find out all this information that makes you better at interpreting and working with the data. So it, it definitely helps. With the caveat that, of course, you won't enjoy every single problem that you you solve as a data scientist, right? Every single data set. Uh, but it's still, I think, the onus is on us to go and seek these people out and at least try our best. Uh, you will meet a lot of domain experts who don't care, right? Who say, "Look, my job is hap I'm happy in my job. I've been doing this for one year, five years, twenty years, thirty years." Um, I don't, I think all this is hype. This is fake stuff. I don't want to talk to you guys. You can't help me, uh, go away. That happens. And then you say, okay, let me see if I can find someone else. And I, I think Marcel would agree with that too. Ab absolutely. I think so. So if you take one definition of intelligence, which is, uh, the ability to adapt to, um, unknown or previously unseen situations or problems, I think the same is true for um, this balance, data science and domain experts. So if we have domain experts that are just ignoring the data science part, at some point, um, well, you can't adapt to it anymore and uh, you're, you're so old school and you're just out of the game, right? And the same from the other end. So. Um, you always have to adapt and you have to uh, learn from what's going on on the other side of the wall, on the other side of the river in order to progress, right? 
nowadays, if we have a, um, we're just looking for coders that also understand operations, right? So nowadays, the the, the huge ballpark, uh, the huge um, market is for DevOps people. Certainly, you still have assembler programmers and prolog programmers and uh, pr programmers that don't understand anything about the ops side. But it's a shrinking domain. And the same for the um, old school ops people that don't care about um, the development side. So I think the same will true event be true eventually for data scientists um, that don't understand the, the subject matter domain. Certainly, they will write the latest and greatest research things. But I think where the where we apply it in the market mm -hmm. at customer problems, you must understand both sides. So speaking to that a little bit, right? Like that research side of it, a lot of these machine learning model, models, algorithms, um, and techniques have been around for a really long time, right? Like since the 80s, 70s, whatever decade you pick. What's caused that recent uptick in like the interest in machine learning, right? Like go back two decades, maybe it was because I was a little younger back then, but like you didn't hear much about like things like, you know, Alexa or, you know, grocery stores that let you walk out without having to meet a cashier, right? Yeah. Or these kinds of things. What's re really helped drive that innovation if those core algorithms are still the same? So, so my one sentence take is that the advent of GPUs and uh, cheap processing uh, and large matrices multiplication being um, ubiquitously available made those um, algorithms actually work at scale. But that's just my uh, <laughs> no, naive. No, and you can, I, I agree with Marcel 100% on this. If you look at... Uh... The first, I think, major breakthrough in what's called deep learning now in this century was, I think, in 2011 or 12, it was something called AlexNet, which was a, a neural network, a convolutional network that was trained on something called ImageNet and got much better performance than all the classical computer vision uh, results till then. And the the innovation was driven by GPUs, by this large data set. ImageNet was a large one that was collected, I think, by people at Stanford. So having that large label data set, having a GPU, and plus Epsilon, where Epsilon is small tricks. Right? So there were things that, uh, in hindsight, look trivial. Like if anyone in the audience has trained a neural net, you know, there's this activation function, and it, it always used to be sigmoid or, or, or a hyperbolic tangent. And they said, let's make it easier. Let's take this thing called a ReLU, rectified linear unit. When you look at it, you say, mathematically, I can teach this to, to maybe a sixth grader or something. But that small thing made it much easier to train deep neural nets. Right? It's much faster to execute the instructions in that one function. So it, it's small things like that, but the 2000s were a period of um, uncertainty in the neural networks community. They were trying things, and I often go back and read papers from, it's, less, it's like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and it's surprising how much uncertainty there was. How do I do this? How do I train this thing? Now we can all go get someone's repo, clone it, and run it. And it, it wasn't that black boxy then. Um, so I think those are, and, and data too, just having large labeled data sets made a massive difference. That was big. I, um, nothing but agreement with, you know, what Marcel and Sanjay are saying. I, um, I think that in addition, a couple other, I don't know, social changes had an impact. I mean, just, you know, we talked earlier about the fact that, you know, these things are all open source tools now and anybody can download them. Um, I mean, when I was first doing this, you know, if you wanted to be doing AI, you like downloaded some papers and, or went to the darn library and photocopied some papers. And, you know, 
spent a few weeks coding some stuff. I mean, that's how you got anything to work. Um, now, you know, you just get a Jupyter notebook, pip install some stuff, and, you know, like you say, look at an example or two on the internet and, like, go to town. Um, so, like, the barrier to entry for smaller, you know, shops with less manpower to actually do anything in the space has gone up enormously just because of the open sourcing. Um, I think that uh, you know, Sanjay talked about data. It's more than just even the size, although that was huge for deep nets. Um, it's just that everybody has data now. That was not always true. Um, you know, it's like everybody's online, everybody's got telemetry of some kind they could tap into, or they've got stuff that's digitized that didn't used to be. So just, you, know, you can't, you can't do machine learning without some data stream. And it just the fact that now everybody basically has access to that kind of data plus tooling is it's caused an explosion in the number of people who just have the raw materials to do ML. Yeah. So one question to Eric and Sanjay, do you see a next leap? Um, or where do you see the next leap? And is that right around the corner or? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that for me, my guess, my best guess is like the next huge leap would be in like synthesizing what we've been calling machine learning, which is very, like you say, very statistical in nature. You throw a lot of data at something you know, in a, a model that you know how to optimize something for, um, which is very good for some things, but not others. And maybe like unifying that with reasoning, which is an awfully loaded term, but just being able to take that kind of low level perceptual, perceptual stuff and combine it with being able to like, you know, make inform decisions from it automatically. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, but the thing that at least I'm very excited about uh, is is reinforcement learning. And it it it's partially because I've been staring at it a lot the last few months. But so there might be many other things that I just have no idea about. But uh, there have been very interesting results doing things, all kinds of things, but I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, you can define a very simple instruction set, an abstract instruction set. Say, these are the allowable operations, things like swapping elements in an array or adding numbers, all that stuff. And you say, can I train an algorithm to sort an array? Simple, right? Quick sort or something. But except you're not telling the algorithm what to do, you're saying, Here's an array, here's a neural net that can generate moves. And uh, most of the time, of course, by chance, it won't just get a sorted array. But you have a reinforcement learning uh, algorithm called policy gradient uh, in the loop. And uh, it discovers essentially quick sort. A similar thing was done with neural net architectures. You have a neural net that generates an architecture for a neural net, trains it on, a, on image net, gets an accuracy, and that feedback is sent back to this agent and it improves the architecture. And uh, that one, today you need a lot of compute power to do these experiments, but you can still beat the state of the art uh, performance on that data set because it finds very novel, uh, you know, LSTM cells and all these things, novel architectures. Uh, the problem with reinforcement learning is it's where, in a very crude sense, it's where deep learning was 10 years ago, where if you actually work with these things, you have to tune things, you have to really dig deep into the internals and say, why is it not working? What's going wrong? Um, which is how deep learning used to be 10, 15 years ago. But my hope is partially because it doesn't need labeled data sets, it just needs something that can say yes, no good, bad, or even give you a reward, which is a continuous score. Uh, if one can get 
reinforcement learning algorithms that can train on smaller and smaller data sets, uh, you could use it in a lot of places where we just can't use supervised learning today. Yeah. Okay, so I, I don't know where the time went, but we're pretty much out of time now. Um, we have one more question from the audience, or two more. Um, the first one is, what helps you keep up with the pace at which AI ML tools uh, and methodologies are evolving? What's kind of your preferred source of information? I guess this may be Sanja and Eric more so, but. Eric? Um, you primarily, primarily it's, you know, I'm gonna call it conferences, but just, you know, venues where you interact with people. Um, the social, social aspect of keeping up with what people are doing is super important. Um, this is going to sound completely ridiculous, but um, I cultivate certain people I follow on Twitter and doggone if like you can't find pretty interesting new stuff going on that way. <laughs> so like amazing enough, so it's you can do more than just like see cool pictures of dogs with social media. Uh, I think the short answer for me is I don't even attempt. And I, I should clarify that. What I mean is, you know, I go to Hack News a lot, and I I have an aversion to Twitter, but there are many leading machine learning researchers on Twitter posting what they're doing. But at some stage, what worked for me is to say, let me pick two or three problems that I care about, right? And do, I, I'll work backwards. And so if that problem says I need to go deep into some reinforcement learning algorithm, I'll do that. If it means I need to learn, uh, you know, something about linear programming, I'll do that. Um, and generally just keeping an eye out, right? But the fact is, if you look at the news, every second day, there's some like AI does X, Y. And if you follow all those things, you, you go insane pretty fast. So I, I just try to ignore it, except for things that are really outliers that are really interesting. Exactly. And I try to talk to Eric, Sanjay, and all my data science folks as a proxy for this. <laughs> yeah. That's the most efficient method, having like multiple yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. re what reinforced Sanjay's comment is it's like to a certain extent, there is no really keeping up. I mean, I, I spend like every day feeling like a caveman. It's just the, the amount of things that are happening right now is stupendous. Yeah. All right. Um, so with that, I think we will wrap this panel up. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I think it was very, very informative. I, at least I enjoyed it. Um, hopefully we'll have you again at DEF CON CZ or something. Um, so as an announcement for everyone else, uh, there is a wrap up party slash trivia thing happening soon. Um, just go go to the closing ceremony under tracks and you should be able to find it. Um, yeah, go well. well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Anish. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Anish. Marcel, get some sleep. Oh, good night. <laughs> yeah, and now I can stay up. I think I play a round of Doom. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. Adios. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.